Today's show is brought to you by BCB Group. You're going to be hearing more about them later on in the show. But for now, let's get into today's conversation. I am so excited for my next guest, Roger Lowenstein, financial journalist, uh, author of so many books, which I've read all but one. And you were out with a new book uh, about the Civil War. Roger, thank you so much for coming on. Jack, a pleasure to talk to you. So, Roger, uh, in your latest book, I, you uh, talk about the, the Civil War. And that was a really pivotal moment, uh, you know, not just for, for the country in terms of political issues, but you know, it really was a turning point in terms of finance. Uh, I learned that from, from reading the book. I got a lot of details I want to go into. Uh, just, just in what ways was it a pivotal moment, and what inspired you to, to write the book? You know, I th- believe your last book, uh, which I really enjoyed, was about the Federal Reserve. What inspired you to go you know, half a century back earlier? Well, that's true. I'm going the wrong way chronologically, but it was actually the last book that inspired me. Uh, The last book was about the creation of the Federal Reserve, which happened in the first uh, decade or two of the 20th century. In researching that book, I was curious about the system that the Fed replaced and um, uh, sort of surprised to find out that uh, that had been devised during the Civil War amidst all the fighting, everything else was going on. And the more I looked into it, uh, the more I discovered that they'd done a whole lot of uh, financial and other innovation uh, during the Civil War, which I don't think uh, most people uh, realize. Uh, our view of the Civil War is obscured by the you know, very important events militarily and emancipation. Uh, just to sort of set the stage, uh, the, the, the biggest thing that happened uh, uh, besides that was that we really had no government going into 1860. We had a, the federal government had a post office. It had some uh, customs offices at the ports that collected duties. And that was kind of it. And the uh, Lincoln government uh, built this whole uh, edifice of the federal government that, you know, the the beginnings that we have today, in particular financially. Uh, We had no national currency. uh, We had no tax system. uh, we, we, um, we, We had no the federal government had no influence over the economy. All that changed in very dramatic ways in the Civil War and ways that endure to today. So that's what inspired me. Yeah, it, it witnessed you know, the birth of the dollar, the, the greenback. I, I think to really get the, the difference and just how revolutionary the Civil War was in terms of uh, finance, Roger, could you paint a picture of what the financial system looked like before the Civil War? It, it looked nothing like it was today. Well, there was no central bank. That had been... Uh, We'd had sort of a prototype central bank until the Andrew Jackson era. That was done away with then. That was a, a quarter of a century earlier. So there were uh, individual banks, so hundreds of them, each chartered by their own states with different rules about uh, what reserves and assets they had. They issued notes, which were IOUs. These weren't officially money, but they circulated. Uh, some, some notes were good. Some banks were bad. Their notes were bad. Usually, if you uh, took a note from a bank across the street, a merchant would accept it. But if you went to a neighboring state or two states away, it might not be accepted or it would be accepted at a great discount. So we had this, um, you know, if you can sort of picture a lot of people in a room, everyone coming from a different country with a different language trying to speak to each other. That was the, the, the antebellum financial system. Uh, on top of that, uh, there was no... Um, tax basis for the government, except for um, uh, the tariff on uh, on imported goods. And, and of course, once the Civil War started, trade uh, dropped uh, quite precipitously. Uh, so that fell out. So there was no means of financing the threadbare uh, government that we had. Uh, and, um, you know, that was that we were a primitive country. Uh, and, and, and strangely, in the sense that by the 1860, we're industrializing. Uh, the economy was uh, you know, well in its way to becoming one of the strongest economies in the world, but financially, uh, we were not. We, we we really had no system. And in what way did that system of uh, separate state banks, no national money system, no taxation system, in what way was that you know woefully insufficient to fund the Civil War? And just you know, can you tell us a, a little bit about how quickly that became uh, apparent? Sure, sure. Well, well. Um, Behind these um, uh, state notes were uh, the, the state bank notes. Most banks had gold, and uh, you could always go and redeem uh, you know, a note for 
to, to the bank for gold if they had the gold. That was that was why they got discounted. Nobody really knew. The Eastern banks were generally stronger. So when the war started, the Secretary of the Treasury, a fellow named Salmon Chase, who had been a, a rival of Lincoln, and um, uh, rather reluctantly accepted the the secondary post mm-hmm. of a of a high cabinet official uh, with with Lincoln as president. He did what we'd done in other wars. He went to the banks, primarily the banks of Philadelphia, Boston, New York, and asked to borrow gold to pay for this vastly greater expense of the war. That had always been sufficient in previous wars, uh, which were much smaller, meaning the War of 1812, although there was inflation there, and the Mexican-American War. Uh, So he goes to the banks, and uh, the banks say to him, look, why don't we lend you our notes, and we'll keep the gold, and, and that will continue to be a, a source of credit for the country. Chase says, no, 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 he's a Jacksonian, he wants their gold. Very reluctantly, they lend him 50 million in coin, in gold coin, which is close to all they have. And when they've lent this sum, they have a celebratory dinner, and one of the bankers stands up and says, Mr. Chase, Mr. Secretary, we've lent you the august sum of 50 million in gold. We trust this will be quite enough to fund your war. Well, I have to tell you, Jack, that before the war was over, he was to spend that 60 times over, 60. And that that gives you an idea of the challenge. Very soon after that dinner, the bank shut the gold window and uh, uh, there was no more gold for practical purposes. Chase had to come up, Chase and Lincoln had to come up with something else to fund the war. And what did they come up with? And uh, how did they go about deciding whether they wanted to sort of just issue paper money, which had a very bad reputation at the time for being inflationary, versus selling bonds, which the United States didn't have a ton of experience doing uh, either. So in the immediate instance, they had very little choice. Uh, They had one choice, which I'll get to, but the United States credit was not very good. The gold windows of the banks had been shut, which meant the United States also uh, couldn't honor its treasury bills in gold. So um, England was not going to lend uh, the kind of sums uh, that uh, that, that uh, the United States needed. They, we had no facility at the time for some sort of mass public borrowing. We didn't have the gold. So paper was it. We had no tax system. So paper was it. Uh, Chase and Congress hit on a very interesting scheme, which was instead of just issuing uh, uh, ordinary notes, which would pay interest uh, and uh, ca- and be redeemed at a certain date, they decide to issue money, meaning legal tender, just like the bills we have in our wallet today. Nobody thinks about the fact that, that the dollar bills in our wallet today don't pay interest or aren't redeemable because they're money, they're money. But that's not the way people thought about it in the 19th century. In fact, pe- people were horrified when he proposed to make bills, paper bills, legal tender. The chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, William Fessenden, the most powerful legislator financially in the country, said, I protest against making anything but gold and silver a legal tender. It offended them morally that only only precious metals were really money, but they had no choice. And they thought by making these bills legal tender, it would compel acceptance by merchants, soldiers would be paid in them, contractors would be paid in them, they could then pass them along, and so on. So that was the first step. But it really wasn't enough because you know, if you just keep printing paper and paper and paper, we know what happened. And they were aware of this. They'd seen it in the Revolutionary War where the Continentals became worthless. Same thing in the Revolutionary War in the French Revolution. And same thing in the Napoleonic Wars in the in the second decade of, the, of that century. So uh, they created something um, equally revolutionary, which was a system of internal taxes, internal to distinguish them from the tariff, which is the only tax system extant. Uh, they created income tax. It was a progressive tax, higher and higher incomes, excise taxes. Uh, They assigned assessors to go throughout the country, every business and private residence, followed by collectors. It was quite intrusive. Remember, this is a country that had, and I think it's fair to say still has, a reputation for extreme antipathy to taxes. Uh, Antipathy to taxes is why the revolution happened. They were against Britain, if you remember that tea dumped in the harbor. And Americans still felt this way. But um, but the uh, Lincoln government uh, recognized, I think really to its credit, that if there weren't some basis behind the government, the paper that it issued uh, would just become paper and would drastically inflate. And, and that led it to this, this tax basis, which, which really worked, uh, gave it uh, an ability to do the third thing, which you touched on, uh, which is to borrow and, and borrow because it had a revenue stream behind it, the government was suddenly considered more creditworthy. 
And um, after they hired Jay Cook to be their agent, uh, they went throughout the country. The banks were tapped out, but the people weren't. And they actually borrowed billions of dollars over the next uh, two or three years of the war. And this really uh, made a seminal difference in the financing uh, of the war, in the, uh, in the prosperity of the North, the viability of its currency. Uh, they did everything the South didn't do and wouldn't do. And it, it really had a great effect on, on the outcome of the war. In your book, uh, Roger, and I'll just uh, put, put this on screen, you've got uh, two charts, uh, one about the uh, southern currency, its, its inflation, its depreciation, and uh, then compared to the, the northern dollar, the, the greenback. And the southern, you can uh, you know uh, enlighten us with the statistics, but the southern currency depreciated so much more. And part of that reason you, you attributed to is... Uh, the South's inability to tax, as well as relying on short-term notes and unable to secure that long-term financing. So, you know, if, if today you think of, let's say, a, a treasury yield curve, there's a three-month on one end and then the 30-year on the other end, the, the South was really going after that, that money market, the short end. Uh, I think you have a statistic about just just how much uh, was short-term paper. and But the long was uh, the North was able to secure longer-term bonds, seven-year notes, 20-year bonds. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how the North was able to secure that financing as well? You mentioned Jay Cook, who might be my favorite character in the book. <laughs> well, uh, Jay Cook was certainly um, uh, morally ambiguous. Uh, he, he considered himself a great patriot. He was his own uh, greatest publicist. He compared his own feats uh, to those of Napoleon uh, uh, and and. Uh, uh, actually said in his memoirs he believed had been uh, God's hand, the, the instrument of God's will to come down and save the North. Uh, I, I should, before people get too carried away with Jay Cook, I should tell you that after the war, uh, he uh, loaded up uh, too much on railroad bonds. Uh, his firm failed and uh, 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 dramatically and cast the country into a depression that lasted seven years. But Jay Cook was certainly the man of the hour in the Civil War. And he recognized that the um, that the northern people could be an unseen army uh, in the war, and the idea that I think we became familiar with in World War One and World War Two that um, the people on the home front can do their bit uh, while the soldiers are fighting and and many of them dying. That really began with with Jay Cook. He recognized the hidden strength in uh, in the northern people. He appealed to. Um, uh, to their greed or, or to their uh, uh, desire to make a profit, assuring them that uh, the strength of the Union economy stood behind these bonds. He also appealed to their patriotism very cleverly. He would publicize the uh, investments of one town against the neighboring towns so there'd be competitions and so on, and much like charity drives and so on today. Um, he really, he resorted to every psychological trip trick. Uh, he also uh, so bored, more or less, newspapers. He was a big advertiser, and he, he basically told them if they didn't print favorable articles on these, uh, many of which he wrote himself, on these uh, uh, bond uh, uh, sales, uh, he'd pull his advertising. So he he, um, he he stopped at nothing. He was very effective and, and, and very instrumental. You talked about long-term and short-term. Uh, I said in the book that uh, the North and South, and really any government, had three choices. Uh, one was to um, uh, to tax, uh, another was uh, uh, to borrow, and the other was to print money. Now, in a sense, uh, printing money, uh, printing notes, and borrowing are the same. Uh, you give a soldier a, a note, and, and that soldier, in effect, is your creditor. But they don't really act the same way. Uh, if, you, if you borrow long term, if you sell somebody a bond for five years or 10 years or 20 years, uh, the bond is, is stashed in a, in a lockbox or someplace uh, in a vault, it doesn't circulate, um, and there's no inflationary effect, therefore, and, and you're secured long-term financing. Uh, if you just print money, the, uh, notes that circulate, uh, uh, people uh, take them to the store, the merchant takes them, they keep circulating around and around. The effect is, is altogether inflationary. And whenever they're redeemed, uh, because these are short-term notes, you're always having to, to cycle out more notes uh, to replace them. And just as, as every government for these reasons would usually rather secure long-term financing, uh, people, the, the people to, to who would be their creditors are not so sure because after all, uh, if you take a long-term bond, uh, you have to know that the credit will be good. Uh, and governments were not considered good credit risks in, in that era. 
So certainly not. England was considered a good credit risk uh, because the bank, the strength of the Bank of England, but the United States wasn't. And um, not at all, but going into the war, our credit, our, our interest rate had gone up to 12%, pretty much a banana republic rate. In fact, the, Chase was turning down offers at 20% and 30%. That was the, he, he accepted the ones at 12%, which is exorbitantly high. But, but just to say there were, there were plenty of people who weren't willing to, to, to lend except at, you know, really double digit uh, rates. The Confederacy had an even worse problem because who knew the Confederacy was new and who knew if it would be around? So um, they, they both faced the challenge of uh, borrowing at um, uh, longer term rates and therefore borrowing at a, uh, in a way that wouldn't be inflationary. And as I said, I think that the tax bases of the North uh, really provided an anchor to convince creditors that its, its credit would be good. Uh, the South uh, made several mistakes. Uh, they had less uh, industry, uh, so that was just a a drawback that they were stuck with. They, when I say less industry, they had less liquid wealth. It was it was pretty hard to sell. A lot of their wealth was in land. Uh, there was declining demand for Southern land, and a lot of their wealth was in slaves. The South did have wealth. They were just reluctant to tax it. They had this uh, uh, anti-federalist or, or, or anti-federal uh, uh, ideology. They didn't want a strong federal government. When they first approved a very modest tax, they insisted that collection be left to their states, and the states just refused to collect it. Uh, they, their, their attitude was, look, we, we seceded because we didn't want to be uh, beholden to Washington. And they didn't much like being beholden to Richmond uh, anymore. In fact, this tension persisted throughout. The, the more Jefferson Davis said, hey, guys, we got to come together, uh, uh, they would say, no, no, we, that's not what we joined the Confederacy for. And this financially uh, really restrained them. Uh, the taxes that they they did pass until the very end uh, didn't include uh, uh, land and slaves, where the bulk of their uh, money was, the uh, uh, bulk of their wealth was. They also made a um, an incredible uh, mistake due to a delusion on cotton. Uh, in the beginning of the war, uh, uh, it was proposed by Judah Benjamin, the Attorney General of the Confederacy, that they ship their cotton, all the available cotton they had at the time, to England where it could be sold off as needed to finance the war. And uh, the South had this delusion that uh, just the, the fact that they had this cotton cartel, they supplied three quarters of the world's cotton. Cotton was the energy today. If, you know, we, we've seen how dependent Europe is on, on Russia's oil. Well, that was Southern cotton then. They were famous for saying cotton is king. Southern Senator famously said no hand dares make war upon us because of cotton. So they refused this idea to ship cotton to England. They didn't believe that that, that there would be a war. Uh, even when the war began, the uh, Secretary of War, uh, with a flourish, took out his handkerchief and said, uh, if any blood is shed, I'll, I'll wipe it away you know, with his handkerchief, as though it was going to be so minor. They thought that Europe, uh, if, it, if the war persisted, would intervene and stop the war. Uh, because it was so uh, desperate for cotton. This turned out to be a, a colossal miscalculation. Uh, and as the war went on and the Northern blockade against the South tightened, uh, remember at the beginning of the war, the sea lanes were open, so they had the opportunity to ship cotton. As the war went on, uh, their source of uh, hard currency uh, diminished. Uh, so, so all these things uh, combined uh, to deprive the, the South of a hard basis for its currency. Uh, they had one opportunity to sell, bond, to monetize their cotton later in the war, which I can talk about if you want. That was another loan opportunity. Yeah, definitely. So Roger, before reading your book, I, I had a vague sense that the South, to put it you know, lightly, had a lot of economic problems. I knew that you know, way more steel was produced in the North. The South was not a diversified economy, to, to say the least. Uh, but reading your book, I, it was only until reading your book, I realized just how much of, of disaster in terms of economically it was. I mean, you had something like 10,000% inflation over the course of, of the war, and there was no way for the South to, to finance it. I'm almost astonished that the South lasted as long as it did. Did you ever wonder that? And do you have any explanation as to how the you know, South was able to persist? Yes. I mean, just to, to put some flesh in those figures, uh, a barrel of flour, obviously an essential item, was $5.50 before the war. Two years into the war, it was up to $38. That's seven times. Uh, by the following year, it was $220. Uh, 
and uh, by the end of the war, it was a thousand dollars. So, so uh, do the math. There were w w when the South. Uh, in fact, uh, you mentioned the, the lack of industry. Uh, printing notes, the printing press became one of their main industries. Um, uh, midway through the war, the South was militarily split in half along the Mississippi River. They actually shipped the printing press to the Western arm of the Confederacy, you know, around the Gulf of Mexico, so that um, so that they could continue to print notes on the Western side of the Confederacy as well as the South and continue the inflation uh, there as well. The, the Richmond Papers by 1864 were reporting a common sight of enslaved blacks uh, toting wheelbarrows full of notes, Southern notes. So Lord only knows uh, what you could buy with a wheelbarrow full of notes by that point. But you know, this was really uh, Weimar stuff. By the end of the war, people were advertising in newspapers to purchase things with uh, salted pork, bacon, and cloth. Uh, the, the money uh, was uh, was worthless. And, you know, I, I, I said that the South had one opportunity to monetize the cotton, which was uh, stuck on their shores. They had a basic problem, which is um, uh, Europe needed the cotton. They needed what Europe had, which was supplies and, and particularly ammunition, but um, they needed the cotton, they needed those supplies now, and Europe couldn't really get hold of much of the cotton until after the war. So a financier approached them and said, uh, uh, we'll do that deal. Uh, give me a very good price for the cotton, and we'll accept the cotton after the war. Uh, we'll, we'll, those bonds, we'll, we'll, he was willing to finance them with bonds backed by cotton, which they'd redeem after the war. This is really a, a dream come true for the South. Uh, but strangely, uh, Jefferson Davis was unwilling to take nearly as much as, this is a financier called Erlanger. Uh, he ran a uh, the French arm of a German uh, banking house. Earl, uh, Erlanger wanted to give them 25 million. As it turned out, uh, there was enough uh, demand to, to underwrite 50, 75 million. This is the middle of the war. It would have been tremendously useful to the South, which was trying to negotiate for a line of steel-plated frigates that would have defended the Southern coast and protected their, their shipping lanes. For, for some reason I could never figure out, the South refused to take more than $15 million of this. It was a, a completely blown opportunity. Uh, and and, and um, you asked about how do they survive um, you know, they they were incredibly courageous on the battlefield. They had this uh, grim, cussed determination, uh, I called it. Uh, as late as 1864, that's the fourth year of the war, uh, which has been a brutal war by then. Uh, they have Grant stuck in the mud uh, in Virginia. Uh, Lincoln's being told on all sides that he's going to lose his reelection bid, uh, the, the, the McClellan, his uh, rival, is presumably then going to strike a peace with the South. Uh, the South is very likely to keep their independence to slavery. Uh, so this is in the fourth year of the war. What what really what ran the South down way before it began to finally lose military battles was in fact in the economic front. And, and Southerners said this. I, I quote a Southern leader saying that the Yankees didn't whip us in the field, we were whipped in the Treasury Department. They began to pine in their newspapers for a Southern salmon chase, a Southern uh, uh, version of a Treasury Secretary who could figure out the financing. Uh, as the Southern people began to starve, which they did, a side of, of, the, of the home front that I get into in some detail, uh, their soldiers began to desert. Uh, the women in Richmond rioted at one point because they were going hungry, uh, and this began to sap their war effort. But I think it really began with their economic collapse. They they outpunched their weight, uh, uh, way outpunched their weight of the battlefield. This episode is brought to you by BCB Group, Europe's leading provider of crypto-friendly business banking for institutions in the crypto space. They also provide trading services, allowing you to trade FX and cryptocurrency quickly and at scale. They specialize in efficient execution of large orders in illiquid markets. So if you are an institution looking to make high volume trades, you need to check out BCB Group because a great trade idea is worth nothing if you can't execute it. And that is exactly what BCB Group helps you to do. Their mission is to empower the global financial revolution through sustainable and innovative banking. Really glad to have them as a sponsor. So if you want to take control of your digital assets, please check them out at bcbgroup.com slash jack. That's bcbgroup.com slash jack.
Thank you, and let's get back to the show. I know you write uh, how there was a shortage of food, people were starving, so the Confederacy demanded food, and that incentivized uh, uh, farmers and slaveholders of large plantations to not grow food, because if they grew, grew food, it, it would be requisitioned. So they just grew tobacco, they, they grew uh, um, cotton. Uh, Roger, one aspect of the, the s- South that really hindered them was the naval blockade. I, I think you write something like only 4% of the cotton in the South uh, was able to to be sold. But there were runners. And I think you say that cotton fetched something like 10 cents a pound in the South, but that in the North and, and especially in Europe, it could fetch up to rates of six times that. So it was a very profitable enterprise for people to have runner ships where they would, you know, illegally, they would s- smuggle the, the goods and the cotton. Um, can you tell us about that? And then, you know, are there any parallels to uh, what's, what's going on with Russia's invasion of Ukraine right now? Sure. Um, and by, by the way, the, 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 uh, the South also resorted to price controls and, and these were uh, completely evaded and, uh, uh, farmers uh, seeing these price controls just hid there. And then they, they, when, when farmers didn't supply grains at the controlled prices, the Southern government just uh, so-called impressed them, which is to seize them at the controlled prices and farmers just uh, hid their supplies. Uh, you know, they, they, and to the great chagrin of Jefferson Davis, uh, they began to circulate greenbacks, the Northern currency themselves. The, the Southern government made that illegal, but it didn't, it didn't matter. Uh, Southern merchants weren't dumb, and they knew that the the northern currency w- was worth more. So the the blockade um, uh, arose sort of organically. Uh, it, it, it worked in two steps. Um, they would um, get these sleek, uh, low draft runners that could go very fast, generally at night, to evade the northern navy from southern ports uh, such as uh, Charleston or New Orleans or Wilmington and many other ports to islands generally British uh, colonial islands. Once there, they would offload into much larger ships, which could ship larger amounts, and they would fly under the British flag uh, to England. So the bulk of the ship was protected. The United States, of course, uh, couldn't attack uh, British trip, uh, ships. They, they did intercede once with the British ship, and that, that caused a great problem uh, for the U.S. diplomatically, and, and, and they didn't do it again. So the trick was to get these goods um, from the mainland to the ports, because of the, uh, the the danger of being captured, they had to use these small ships, only go when at nighttime and so on. The volumes are necessarily uh, much smaller. Uh, so this greatly restricted uh, uh, the, the volume, the, the total volumes. Nonetheless, the first year of the war, it's estimated that nine out of 10 ships got through. It was, it was the Northern Navy, Northern didn't really have a Navy, but uh, as the, the shipyards in the North worked overtime, there were more and more cruisers and more and more of these ships were caught. And uh, you know, th- this acted like uh, a tourniquet on the, um, on the South. And it really put the lie to their whole economic conception. Uh, before the war, uh, various um, people had warned the South Southerners that they had to industrialize, that their, uh, uh, that their economic system was imbalanced and precarious. They were dependent on the North for basically everything manufactured. Uh, just a, uh, Ohio and Alabama states of roughly equal size. Ohio had twelve times as many railroads. Uh, that just uh, so and and once the war uh, uh, began, the, the South could no longer import from the North. Uh, uh, you know they were in trouble, and and they they were they had to rely on this uh, this stream of Rhett Butler type type characters. And the, most of the blockades were under uh, uh, private charter. So the blockade runners ship what they what they wanted. They often ship luxury goods such as silk because it didn't take up a lot of room. They were very expensive, so they could get a higher value for less space. This infuriated Jefferson Davis, who wanted things like heavy arms, which of course took up more space, bulkier, heavier ship. The the Southern government uh, ultimately chartered some of its own ships, uh, but but um, uh, they just didn't have the wherewithal to do it uh, in size. I think there is. Um, a great, a great parallel today. Uh, uh, the South had one other venue for its cotton, which was strangely enough, uh, the North. Uh, Lincoln and Chase were very eager to bring cotton out of the North and sell it themselves for hard currency in Europe. Uh, they also wanted to, uh, England and France were suffering a depression because their textile industries had no cotton. Uh, they were very afraid that 
that England and France might intervene in the war on the Confederate side and force a peace. This was the South's great hope. This is really what, what they were fighting for. They weren't going to win uh, militarily. And so um, Lincoln and Chase hit in this program of authorizing uh, designated traders who applied for permits to go down into the occupied territory, purchase cotton from uh, supposedly loyal Southerners who pledged a lo an oath of loyalty uh, to the North. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a really absurd policy to rely uh, on these people. Uh, once the money uh, got into the, into the occupied territory, there was no stopping it from seeping into the, in, into the South and the, the Confederate coffers. General Sherman was just incensed. He said, you cannot uh, trade with the people and carry on war against them at the same time. Of course, he was, he was absolutely right. And uh, Grant was also incensed. They, they passed actually um, uh, resolutions uh, forbidding uh, traders in their territories from using uh, gold or silver or any kind of authorized currency. They said, if, you wanna, if you're authorized, you can use IOUs, which would have stopped the trade, which is what they wanted. The Treasury Department forbade them. However, uh, uh, Sherman said, uh, uh, money, money is as much contraband in war as powder. A very interesting comment, really, going to what we're talking about. I think this really goes to the situation that NATO, and to some extent the U.S. is in today, uh, uh, carrying on this trade uh, for Russian oil and gas. I think um, you know, the, 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 the cotton traders were underwriting a, a slave system. Uh, you know, I think we can say an immoral system, uh, quite freely. And, I, and with the growing evidence of, um, of uh, atrocities and crimes against humanity in, in, committed by the Russians in Ukraine, uh, there's not just a, a logistical, but also a moral imperative, I think, to stop this trade in, uh, in Russian oil and gas in, uh, on the part of NATO in the U.S. You write that Vladimir Putin is making the same miscalculation that doomed Jefferson Davis's Confederacy a century and a half ago. And uh, you say that the, the West should learn from uh, the mistake of uh, issuing licenses that, that, that uh, Lincoln issued to cotton traders and impose a total ban on uh, Russian energy products. Uh, and, and then you're talking about not just the U.S., which I believe has already done so, but Europe, which now is pondering, uh, you're, they're making some steps to ban coal, but you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of natural gas is still flowing from Russia into to Europe. So just- you know, so, so is oil, so is oil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I think that will require sacrifices in the U.S. Uh, as well, because uh, we can't expect the Europeans to freeze. We're gonna have to share, export more of our resources. Uh, I think in the short to medium term, we're going to have to make uh, difficult but probably necessary trade us with our own energy policy and drilling. Uh, do we do we want uh, uh, you know we, we can't expect the Europeans to endure a depression or humanitarian crisis at home. Uh, we may have to drill you know more in the short term until there are alternatives. Uh, so, uh, but but you know they're based on the pictures we're seeing in the newspapers, war crimes going on as we speak. Uh, and I, I think that was very analogous. I think also that there's an analogy uh, in the beginning of the war. Uh, I think Putin counted on the West uh, to be malleable because of its uh, dependence on oil and gas. I think he's discovered that the war is obviously has gone more toughly, uh, more difficult than expected. I think the South also expected that because cotton was king, uh, so-called, uh, you know, they, they could have their way. Uh, uh, and so I think both Putin and the South were deluded. And I think they were both deluded by living in this sort of isolated uh, echo chamber of a, of a secluded cartel economy. Putin increasingly listening to only to his own advisors, uh, thinking that the West and the democracies were weak. Uh, the South actually uh, was in its own echo chamber. It actually believed that uh, slavery was a superior system, that there'd be more labor conflict in the North and that, that uh, the North had a weaker system and, and, and would be dependent on, on Southern cotton. Uh, but but the proving them wrong, of course, obviously requires that we today stand up to, to Putin and Russia. Roger, um, as you know, a lot of recessions and depressions are 
preceded by surges in commodity prices, particularly energy and, and natural gas. I was just looking at, at a study that found that when uh, oil uh, goes above 3% of, of global GDP in terms of price consumed, that typically you know, can cause a recession. Uh, you know, I hear that a lot today in 2022, but I actually I don't remember um, fr from your book the, the fact that Britain and France uh, were in a depression because of the, the cotton, uh, uh, the, the surge in the price of cotton. So, you know, do you find that history you know, uh, validates the, the theory that humongous surges in the price of commodities can cause recessions and even depressions? And if so, you know, how does that affect the calculus of today? Well, they had a huge supply chain problem. We're very familiar with what, what the, the biggest industry in the uh, 1850s and 60s were textiles. Textiles was, was, was where the Industrial Revolution began. You know, all these red brick mills in New England, those are textile mills in Lancaster, in England, in Manchester, in Lyon, in France. Those are textiles. That was the, the big industry that, that really triggered the Industrial Revolution. Suddenly, there's no cotton. So uh, there, there were hundreds of thousands of, of mill workers unemployed. There's starvation reported in both England and France. Uh, it, was, it was a depression in that sense. Uh, look, uh, in the 70s, uh, we had a, uh, a severe depression or a recession in 73, 74. Uh, we had another one in, uh, in 1980 triggered by uh, the Fed had to act, obviously, uh, very stringently against the inflation of the late 70s, which created the back-to-back -back, uh, uh, inflation uh, uh, recessions of 80 and 82 uh, under Volcker. Uh, and, and again, uh, uh, the price of oil shot up uh, in 1990, uh, the invasion of uh, the American invasion of Kuwait to, to kick out Iraq, and we had a, a recession uh, then as well. Uh, uh, I... I uh, uh, I'm not going to get into predicting recessions. You know the old uh, line about uh, uh, predicting uh, nine out of every three recessions or something. Uh, you know, it's, it's a risk. Uh, it, it's a risk. We've had a, a very strong recovery, uh, but but we've had uh, uh, incredible growth in demand even before the, and I mean I mean monetary demand. I mean stimulus and and you know if you take Larry Summers' word and I do. Uh, I think uh, overstimulus even before the, the the bad luck in a sense of, of the Ukraine war, and uh, I think you know sometimes if a recession comes, it comes. We can't. Uh, uh, sometimes there's no avoiding one, and 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 that 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 will uh, set things back in balance, and we may need then further stimulus when that comes. But but we'll see. We'll see. It's it's it's, it's certainly a risk, but. I, I, I can't put a number on it, a percentage on it. Yeah, you, you talked about inflation. If if we can roughly put the inflation of the North during the Civil War, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe in the U.S. 1970s territory, maybe a little bit more, um, and then the South that you mentioned earlier, maybe a little bit more in the Weimar territory of you know 10, 20 thousand percent inflation. Uh, yeah. This is, so the South was a nine thousand percent, absolutely Weimar territory. Uh, Weimar before Weimar. The North, uh, I think the better comparison for me anyway, is uh, to uh, latter wars. It was 80% over the course of the war, which is significant. Uh, but wars create demand, excess demand. So you're going to have some inflation. Uh, interestingly, in World War I and the World War II periods, it was also just about 80%. So the fact that they uh, they did no worse than in the latter era when there were far more financial tools, far more experience and so on. You know, I think that's that that was painful, but but given the circumstances, reasonable. What happened in the South obviously was unreasonable financially. Mm. Uh, so, Roger, the inflation that we see today, you said you you believe that the Larry Summer view. Could you describe what you mean by by the Larry Summer view? Uh, and in particular, you know, is it demand side inflation? Is it supply side inflation? And does the answer to that question? Uh, uh, tell us whether or not you know rate hikes and, and federal uh, uh, tightening of monetary policy will be effective. Well, look, we just had a quarter of a point uh, increase in the federal funds rate to, uh, I, I guess now it's officially between a quarter and a half or something like that. If inflation is 7.9%, uh, that means we've gone from a, uh, a real interest rate of uh, 
help me with the math here, negative 800 basis points to negative, negative 775 or 750. It's absurdly stimulative. This debate, as uh, uh, and, and this is one of Summers' uh, uh, seminal points, it really can't be overstressed, about whether it's supply or demand. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve can't do anything about supply, uh, you know, in any near term and, and maybe not even the long term. They can't uh, get more cars and more computer ships, chips uh, shipped to Los Angeles. They can't. All, all they can do is affect demand. It's their job to make sure that demand is in is in rough parity with supply, whatever the supply is. So to say, well, the supply dipped. Uh, that's not an answer. That's not an excuse. It's their job to make sure that the that the demand is adequate and no, and not more than adequate to the supply. When you have demand, when you have inflation now running at eight percent, that's you know prima facie evidence that demand has way outstripped supply. We're not blaming the Fed for the fact that computer chips aren't arriving at our, at our docks. We're blaming them that for people have more money than the available supply of computer chips and, and other products. And, um, uh, you know, absent any, uh, by the way, this is also what happened in the 70s. We had, uh, we had the, the uh, government of Lyndon Johnson trying to fight two wars in Vietnam and the war on poverty, carried over to Nixon. And then that was coupled with the bad luck of, uh, of the uh, first oil shock in 73 and later the second, the Iran oil shock. Uh, so you, you can't count on good luck. Uh, finances, I said this in the book, is always the art of planning for the worst. It's like building a bridge. Uh, you, know, you, don't, you don't build a bridge with just enough steel to carry light trucks, because someday there may be a heavy truck uh, going over it. And, and to keep saying, uh, we're sure you know, su supply chain is gonna, gonna readjust, this is gonna be gone soon. The Fed has in effect been planning for the best. And when the best didn't occur, there's, and I, 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 I don't know what basis they thought this, but in any case, You've got to plan for the worst. And, and since we've sort of gotten a dose or two of bad luck, we've not only had the, the 5 or 6% inflation that we would have had anyway, but now with the war, we're up to, I think, 7.9, you know, tremendous wage growth, but, but stimulating inflation that is, that is overlap wage growth and, and, and thus uh, taken away the, the long overdue real gains of, of workers. Uh, so I'd be very surprised if if uh, these uh, quarter point uh, increases in uh, in the federal funds rate are, are going to do it. Uh, you know whether or not there's inflation. I'll, I'll only say this that 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 the sooner the the uh, the bigger increases come, uh, the easier they'll go down. The less likely uh, a recession or other really unpleasant aftermath will be. The the longer you wait for the stiff medicine. Uh, the, the more impalatable I think it'll be. Mm. And the stiff medicine, uh, some fear that that will cause a severe uh, drop in asset prices. And you know, asset prices have, have been on a tear uh, since 2009. You, you chronicled uh, the rise of the Federal Reserve. How have you seen you know, its mandate uh, drift? I believe maybe it was in the 60s that it, it uh, came up with the idea of... Uh, stable employment and you know stable inflation, uh, the dual mandate. Uh, but then there's sort of a, a hidden mandate that asset prices shouldn't go down, the, the Bernanke theory that uh, if asset prices go down, then uh, people will, will you know spend less money, uh, firms won't hire, and it will sort of be a daisy chain that will lead to a recession. If it is the case that the only way to curb inflation is to impose a recession like Volcker did twice um, uh, in the 1980s, uh, how do you think the, the Federal Reserve's appetite is if it you know wh which path is it going to choose you know yeah well I, I see what Bernanke's philosophy is more that um, uh, he, he didn't want to pop asset bubbles because a he believed uh, he's a pretty strong believer in the efficient market hypothesis that that therefore you know forward looking you couldn't tell what was a bubble and secondly uh, interest rates are blunt tools uh, so you know we don't want to send the United States economy to pick an easy Example into a recession just to prick the crypto crypto bubble. Uh, you know, let's say you thought crypto should be ten thousand dollars, not forty thousand dollars, whatever it is today. Or let's say you thought it should be at zero. You probably wouldn't want to put uh, steel workers out of work for that purpose. Uh, but the um, it, it wasn't the Fed. Let's go back to the dual mandate: uh, employment and uh, uh, and stable money. Uh, 
Uh, it wasn't the Fed that changed that, it was Congress. Uh, and, and I'm completely okay with a dual mandate because uh, after all, if, if you don't have stable employment, if you have a depression, the money's not gonna be stable either. So, so they're, really, they're really consistent. I, I think the danger is when um, the natural temptation of, uh, of, of central bankers who, uh, who, who get their advice from economists and, and bankers and people who sort of swim in a Wall Street world is to be overly afraid of the effect of, of an asset crash. And I think, you know, I, although I don't think it's their job to uh, usually to prick bubbles, nor is it their job to, uh, to defend asset prices. And I think that's, that's the real risk. And you know, they, they, have, they have a clear congressional mandate uh, to promote a long-term maximum employment and stable prices. And, and, and they've interpreted stable prices as, as 2% with 2% inflation. And that's, that's fine because of the stickiness of employment. You know, it's, it's easier, it's hard to lay people off. So, so it, there's an argument that economies are more efficient with a little bit of inflation because it's hard to lower prices. That's fine. But when you get to 7%, you're way beyond 7% inflation, 8% inflation. You know, you're no longer in the neighborhood at 2%. Uh, and I think, I think they've got to do whatever is necessary to get back down in that neighborhood. And if asset prices crack, uh, that means they were too high and, and uh, we'll survive. And it's, you know, would you better to have the Dow from, you know, correct from 30,000 than from 60,000. I mean, it's, you know, we've, we've seen this, we've seen this very often and we, we had a severe recession, very painful in the Volcker period. But, but after that, you know, we went on a tear in the 1980s, both asset prices and the economy that the, 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 the uh, American economy was really, and really, if you discount the uh, the very brief recession of 1990, which was wholly uh, uh, a product of uh, of the Iraq War, uh, the economy had 18 years of solid growth. Uh, you know, once once Volcker had put it on a sounder footing. So um, I'd like to see the Fed. Um, less the guardian of asset prices and more the guardian of, of what Congress, uh, which created it, uh, mandated it's, it should be the guardian of. Mm. Well, we, we may get to see that. Um, Roger, as we reach a close, I want to ask you, what was your biggest learning uh, from the book? Something that you took away from, from all of your research? You know, I can think of like five, but I want to hear your answer. I think the um, humility of uh, President Lincoln is something that... Um, particularly in today's, you know, people ask me a lot, because it's a Civil War book, are we going for another Civil War and so on. Um, I'm reminded of um, uh, when he was a congressman, this is in 1847, he had one term in Washington before, uh, way before he was uh, president, and he proposed an internal improvement. Lincoln felt very strongly about building canals, the Transcontinental Railroad, improving harbors, things to improve uh, trade, particularly for people in the, in the interior of the country where the transportation system uh, wasn't very uh, good or, or, or complete. Uh, this, this is, the, of course, the build back uh, better of his day. And it was, it was very necessary. Imagine America had, you know, Eisenhower not built the national highway system. This government had to do these things. And uh, he believed that uh, a government uh, existed to do things that people couldn't or wouldn't do for themselves. Uh, so he proposes this bill for internal improvements. And someone on the other side just eviscerates him. He just attacks him uh, unrelentingly. And when the guy's finished, Lincoln gets up again, doesn't defend himself, doesn't defend his plan. He just says, says well, uh, most things, especially of government policy, aren't all good or all evil. Uh, most are a combination of some good and some evil. And we're just looking for things that have more good than evil in them. You know, I would love to hear uh, People talk about uh, the issues of our day uh, in that vein, acknowledging that people on both sides have a point of view, that there are trade-offs, uh, that there are trade-offs to taxation and equality and, and just about uh, 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 oil policy, any issue we can think of instead of um, the, uh, you know, the sort of uh, moralism on, on either side. Uh, he was really a remarkable, not just a remarkable leader, but a remarkable person. Um, that, that would be my first takeaway.
Well, uh, Roger, it's been an absolute pleasure getting the chance to uh, pick your brain. Um, the book is Ways and Means, uh, Lincoln and His Cabinet and the Financing of the Civil War. Roger, thank you so much. Jack, always a pleasure. 